Good morning, namaste, aloha. My name is John Apati Das, and we are here on this Sunday to do another Krishna book reading. So um, let us purify our hearts in the bathing of Radhakunda Shamakunda, which is the same as the Harinama or the hearing and chanting of Krishna's names. I'd like to offer my respects to everyone here and also offering respect, respectful obeisances to my spiritual master.
Hari Bo. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Okay, we are continuing with our story. Now, as you recall from the last video, if you haven't watched any of my videos and this is your first video, I recommend you go back in my YouTube channel, start from the first Krishna book reading one and read all, watch all the videos all the way through so you can get the backstory of like what's gone on so far. But basically, we are in the, um, not quite in the Vrindavan village yet. They're in a location called Gokula and uh, they, the situation happened that Kamsa, as we remember, started to send demoniac demons to try to, to kill children and in the hopes of finding the person that's supposed to kill him. So he doesn't quite know yet that Krishna is in Vrindavan or in Gokula or in this area. So anyway, Putana comes and she's, you know, she has enough foresight to see that this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Putana was a witch who could shape shift, right? So she shifts into this very beautiful woman and just walks right into the village and nobody knows this is because they all think she's the goddess of fortune come in. She's so beautiful and they're just like, and then she comes in and she wants to, you know, breastfeed uh, the baby Krishna. But what she does is she puts poison on her nipple. But as we see, Krishna being the Supreme Personality of Godhead, at once accepts her offering to give her give the milk, but also kills her by sucking his life, sucking the milk and the life air out of the, the witch. And she assumes her whole form. And then this is where the villagers were praying to Lord Vishnu to protect the baby child. Thus, Mother Yashoda began to chant different names of Vishnu to protect the child Krishna's different bodily parts. Mother Yashoda was firmly convinced that she should protect her child from different kinds of evil spirits and ghosts. Now, as you remember, the villagers in Vrindavan, under the influence of Yoga Maya, due to the influence of Krishna, do not see Krishna in his supreme personality of God had formed. They just think that he's their beloved child. And sometimes when these wonderful things happen, they're like, huh, you know, maybe he's some kind of demigod or some kind of very important, uh, you know, they don't, they don't understand. But then under this influence of Yoga Maya, which is the internal potency of the supreme personality of God in the spiritual world, in the material world, that's the shadow figure of that is what we know as is also Maya Devi or Durga. Maya Devi, she uh, influences the living entities in the material world to believe that they're their body and they're, um, that they are living out a life is this person and this is their family and this is their home and this is their nation. And, and this is the influence of uh, Maya Devi in this, in this uh, material world, which is a shadow figure of Yoga Maya, but Yoga Maya is different. Yoga Maya is the in, in, internal spiritual potency of Krishna, uh, and it also uh, influences people to think differently. You know, in this case of Vrindavan, or in the in the Gokula, the villagers they all think of Krishna as their child or their friend, albeit the most wonderful friend, they can't get enough of him. They love him so much. And so, of course, they're like, oh, we got to protect Krishna because Krishna is very dear. So they start praying the different names of Krishna in his Vishnu form. So protecting him from evil kinds of spirits and ghosts, right? Namely, Dakinis, Yatudanis, Kushmandas, Yakshas, Rakshashas, Vinakyas, Kotara, Revati, Jeshta, Putana, Matrakas, 
Urumadas. So these are different spirits and names of different types of ghosts and evil spirits. And similar other evil spirits who cause persons to forget their own existence and give trouble to the life, air, and the senses. Sometimes they appear in dreams and cause perturb perturbation. Sometimes they appear as old women and suck the blood of small children. So we were talking about these kind of things and how real this is. People sometimes see ghosts and they see, um, they see, you know, there are things in, there are a lot of spiritual entities, I shouldn't say spiritual entities, but like, like entities that live, they're not really spiritual, <laughs> but they are what they call spirits because they, 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 there are so many dimensions and so many kinds of uh, living entities in the world that we can't perceive because of the material makeup of our body but sometimes by the influence of our mind the mind is a subtle energy we perceive ghosts because ghosts exist on the subtle level they are the subtle body in other words the living entity oftentimes may if they commit suicide or they die in some situation that's very crazy like a, a car crash or um, most likely drugs or suicide uh, they 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 don't they continue to exist the living entity is still attached to his subtle body but the gross physical body has been killed so therefore it has to live out the rest of its life normal life that it was supposed to live out in its subtle body which is a really hellish situation that and that is what is known as ghosts so it is a real thing it does exist and like i've said my in my travels overseas i've seen many of very strange things people being possessed by spirits in west africa through you know the ava cult which is like the like voodoo voodoo uh, religions and uh, practices and uh, these things they are considered to be what they call them, uh, religion in the modes of ignorance so in other words people worship they worship nature or they worship spirits as some kind of sp spiritual entities but actually what they are is just disembodied spirits, ghosts, and things like that. So, and they can possess people and stuff like that. So that those things do exist. Sometimes they appear in dreams and cause much perturbation. Sometimes they appear as old women suck the blood of small children. But all such ghosts and evil spirits cannot remain where there is chanting of the holy name of God. Mother Yashoda was firmly convinced of the Vedic injunctions about the importance of cows and the holy name of Vishnu. Therefore, she took all shelter in the cows and the name of Vishnu just to protect her child, Krishna. Krishna and his names are all powerful. If for some reason you're being bothered by spirits or you see ghosts, you can chant, chant, and they will not remain. They will, they'll leave you alone. She recited all the holy names of Vishnu so that he might save the child. Vedic culture has taken advantage of keeping cows and chanting the holy name of Vishnu since the beginning of history. And persons who are still following the Vedic ways, especially the householders, keep at least one dozen cows and worship the deity of Lord Vishnu, who is installed in their house. The elderly gopis of Vrindavan were so absorbed in the affection of of Krishna that they wanted to save him, although there was no need to, for he had already protected himself. They could not understand that Krishna was the supreme personality of Godhead playing as a child. After performing the formalities to protect the child, Mother Shoda took Krishna and let him suck her own breast. When the child was protected by Vishnu mantra, Mother Shoda felt that he was safe. In the meantime, all the coward men who went to Mathura to pay tax returned home and were struck with wonder at seeing the gigantic dead body of Putana. Nanda Maharaj recalled the prophecy of Vasudeva and considered him a great sage and mystic yogi. Otherwise, how could he, how could he have?
foretold an incident that happened during his absence from Vrindavan. After this, all the residents of Raja cut the gigantic body of Putana into pieces and piled it up with wood for burning. So I did mention the fact that they were in Gukula. I remember the point that they actually they moved because the, the demon demoniac forces, they moved out of that area into the village of Vrindavan. So when all the limbs of Putana's bodies were burning, the smoke emanating from the fire created a good aroma. How could that be? Well, I'm going to read that right here. This rum was due to, due to her being killed by Krishna. This means that the demon Putana was washed of all her sinful activities and attained a celestial body. So, because she had been touched by the, the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, her bo the body, the physical body that was left over was, was, pure, was purified also of any... So when it burned, it smelled good. Instead of normally like putrid flesh, it would, it would sound hor smell horrible. Here's an example of how the Supreme Personality of Godhead is all good. Putana came to kill Krishna, but because he sucked her milk, she was immediately purified and her dead body attained a transcendental quality. Her only business was to kill small children. She was only fond of blood. But in spite of being envious of Krishna, she attained salvation because she gave her milk to him to drink. So what can be said of others who are affectionate to Krishna in the relationship of mother or father? So the practice of satana bhakti or the practice of chanting Krishna's names can have is all good fortune for the, the individual. Because even it, it shows how powerful the service to the Supreme Lord can be that a person coming along could be living their life envious of Krishna, wanting to enjoy in the world. They come in the presence of a devotee of Krishna, or they come to the, you know, whatever it might be, a temple, or, or whatever they do, they, they, they smile at the devotee. That is, all a, that is a very great benediction for that person. Just that one act, kind act, towards a devotee of Krishna, any devotee of Krishna, and uh, towards the mission of the devotee of Krishna. The pure devotees always serve Krishna with great love and affection, for he is the supreme personality of Godhead, the super soul of every living entity. It is, it is concluded that, therefore, that even a little energy extended, expended in the service of the Lord gives one immense transcendental profit. That's what you know, I just said, Bhaktivedanta is saying that. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita, Shvalpam api asya dharmasya. Devotional service in Krishna consciousness is so sublime that even a little service to Krishna, knowingly and or unknowingly, gives one the greatest benefit. The system of worshiping Krishna by offering flowers from a tree is also beneficial for the living entity who is confined to the bodily existence of that tree. So the the the, the process, the spiritual process of coming closer to God is so easy and there's so many things that you can do just by listening to Krishna Katha or Bhagavad Katha which is the, the pastimes of the Lord right now in this video is beneficial for anyone who can hear because it's translated and purported upon by a pure devotee in this in the Krishna book AC Bhaktivedanta Swami um, the hearing of the chanting the looking of the, the picture of Krishna, the thinking about Krishna, the offering your food to Krishna. There's so many things that you can do. You can get up in the morning, you can practice japa meditation or, or kirtan meditation or garanga breathing. Uh, you can look at this and what's that? Oh, this is Lord Nishringadev. What was, oh, Lord Nishringadev. You know, there's so many things that you can do that are beneficial for you, that help you come closer to Krishna. And it's very easy and it's joyfully performed. When the flowers and fruits are offered to Krishna, the tree that bore them also receive much benefit indirectly. So the living entity also too. You can go and you can, how do you, it's like, you can't go and preach to dogs or trees about Jesus or whatever, or, or, or Krishna. You can't say, well, let's read the, you know, let me tell you about, 
you know, spiritual, whatever. They may, you know, hearing it is, is good, but, but really understanding the philosophy is impossible for trees or dogs or anybody but a human because in the human form of life, we can comp comprehend things. Animals and trees are in such in lower modes of nature, so therefore, you know, animals can be in modes, mixed modes of ignorance and, and passion. And the trees, the living entities and trees are in modes of ignorance because they're standing, they're in the stand same form. They're stuck in this, you know, but you can benefit them. You can take their, their flowers, their leaves, you can go chant around them and benefit them. So we, even when you offer food, you offer the food, the, the plants that bore those vegetables, also the, the living entities in those plants also benefit. So there are living entities everywhere, all over. So you can be chanting constantly and you're benefiting not only yourself, but the, everyone around you. So this is a wonderful process to not only help yourself spiritually come to understand your true nature but also help everyone else that's the true welfare of this of this age we can we can pass laws we can try to tell people to think in a certain way you know don't be racist against this person don't don't hate these people but unless people understand their true nature they they'll op they'll operate on a bodily level and therefore they'll never there will never be any solution to, to the world's problems. But if people understand, aham brahmasmi, I am spirit soul. My, my purpose in my life is to come to know my relationship with, with, with God and to help others come to know their relationship with God in the truest sense. And that way also to know the brotherly existence, the brotherly and sisterly existence that we have in this material world with not just people in human forms of life, but animals and plants as well. So this is a, you know, a wonderful thing that we can actually engage in. And it is the greatest welfare for humanity. It will bring the greatest benefit. The Archana process or worshiping procedure is therefore beneficial for everyone. Krishna, Krishna is worshipable by great demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva, and Bhutana was so fortunate that the same Krishna played in her lap as a little child. The lotus feet of Krishna, which are worshipped by great sages and devotees, were placed on the body of Bhutana. People worship Krishna and offer food, but automatically suck the milk from the body of Bhutana. Devotees therefore pray that if simply by offering something as an enemy, Bhutana got so much benefit, then who can measure the benefit of worshiping Krishna in love and affection? It's greater. One should only worship Krishna if for no other reason than so much benefit awaits the worshiper. If Patana was an evil spirit, she gained elevation just like the mother of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is clear that the cows and the elderly gopis who offered milk to Krishna were also elevated to the transcendental position. Krishna can offer anyone anything from liberation to anything materially conceivable. Therefore, there cannot be any doubt of the salvation of Patana, whose bodily milk was sucked by Krishna for such a long time. And how can there be any doubt about the salvation of the gopis who were so fond of Krishna? Undoubtedly, all the gopis and cowherd boys and cows who served Krishna and Vrindavan with love and affection were liberated from the miserable condition of material existence. My time, okay. Okay, we'll finish. We've got one more paragraph here. When all the inhabitants of Vrindavan smelled the good aroma from the smoke of the burning Putana, they inquired from each other, where is this good flavor coming from? And while conversing, they came to understand that it was the fumes of the burning Putana. They were very fond of Krishna. And as soon as they heard that the demon Putana was killed by Krishna, they offered blessings to the little child out of affection. After the blessed burning of Patana, Nanda Maharaj came home and immediately took up the child on his lap and began to smell his head, which is a way, a very affectionate way in India to, to, you know, be affectionate to your child, smell the head of your child. In this way, he was very, he was quite satisfied that his little child was saved from this great calamity. Srila Shukadeva Goswami has blessed all persons who hear the narration of the killing of Putana by Krishna. They will surely attain the favor of Govinda. 
Thus ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of the sixth chapter of Krishna Putana killed. So next time we will read another, <laughs> yet another demon that tries to come and kill Krishna and Balaram, the people of Vrindavan. And that will be the salvation of Trinavarta. Uh, so some really wonderful philosophy in here. Uh, main recap is just that Putana was given salvation just by offering her milk, even if it was as an enemy. He, she still offered something to Krishna. And the point was being that A.C. Bhaktivedanta was saying that if an enemy can offer, or even jokingly, sometimes people walk by and, you know, Hare Krishna, but they, they say it, <laughs> Hare Krishna, then they're benefited spiritually by just doing that. But if you engage in a spiritual, with a little bit of faith that, okay, I want to take this, and then you have that taste of happiness, you want to engage in it more. You want, and you can feel this sort of um, relationship of, of love starting to be generated within, your, within yourself. And so you keep engaging and you want to engage more like eating from this feast. You taste a little bit, wow, that's amazing. And then you, you know, you let that go through your body or you let it, you eat it. And then you're like, oh, I want to have some more. So these are the one, most wonderful ways that we can, you know, it's said in the Bhagavad Gita that, that uh, how can there be peace? I'm not kind of paraphrasing, but how can there be peace without, you know, this, um, uh, a peace of mind really so if you if we're agitated consistently by the modes of material nature in our mind just oh I gotta have this I gotta do that that person said that I'm so angry da, da, da. so many hatred and angry anger and so much um, inimical reactions to things and desires to control and enjoy that no wonder we have a really screwed up world but yet the answer is very simple. The answer is, is to engage in the process of Krishna Katha, to engage in the process, process of Shravanam, Kirtanam, the hearing and chanting of Krishna's names. Bathe yourself in that, like you've just been like mucked up by the material world. Bathe yourself and you start, wow, that really feels great. And you'll find that, wow, not only do I feel better, I can react in a better situation. I don't get so angry anymore. I understand and have compassion for my fellow human or my I have compassion for everyone. And this is a wonderful way to go. This is a, the right way to go for society. Not just trying to artificially put band-aids on things like, oh, there's a problem. Let's let's spend money on this and, and force people to think this way. People will not think this way unless they, have happiness from within. So let's do some chanting.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will see you for the next chapter. Stay tuned. Howdy, Bob.